High Church family. If you're a guest with us, you're especially welcome, but uh, I'm glad to be back from uh, vacation for the last couple Sundays. Uh, vacation was filled with lots of family activity, taking uh, Michael to and from camp up outside of Plattsburgh, Moore's camp, and then going to get Adam, who worked at Camp of the Woods up in Speculator, New York. We went to get him and then and regroup for a few days and then took him out to Houghton College and back. And the highlight, of course, is my son James uh, got married to a wonderful lady by the name of CJ up in Ottawa, Ontario. And we had a chance to see that. And so we're just very grateful for what the Lord has done. But I'm, I'm glad to be proclaiming the word of the Lord today. And I want to invite you right now to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter Eight. And while you're looking that up, let me ask you a question. Uh, what are some examples of things that people are afraid of? Now, that's probably, I suspect, not a hard question because people have a lot of fears in their lives. Some common fears are, are people are afraid of what people think of you. They're afraid of, afraid of public speaking, flying, being far from home, spiders, failure uh, or rejection, or losing a loved one, disease or pain, death not having enough money. Those are some common fears. Do any of you have unusual fears? Uh, sometimes fear, people fear things that uh, most people would think, well, that's unusual. My mother-in-law, my stepmom, uh, sorry, not my mother-in-law, my stepmom, her name was Hilda. She passed away some years ago, but she had a uh, what I would call a very unusual fear. I, didn't, I never experienced this firsthand with her, but she would insist, apparently, I'm told, that when she would cross a bridge in the car, she would insist that the windows be put down. Now, I'm talking about a bridge, maybe any bridge, but definitely a bridge like the one that, that uh, goes across the St. Lawrence River between Canada and New York. It's a large bridge comparable to the bridge that goes across um, to, to Rhinebeck. And so when she would go across the bridge, she would insist that the windows be put down. And it was because of fear. <laughs> now, this is kind of unusual. Um, and I mean, it could be 20 below zero in the winter. It didn't matter. She wanted the windows put down as you cross the bridge. And you know what she was afraid of? She was afraid that if the car crashed and went off the bridge and plunged into the water, that if the windows were not down, you'd be trapped in the car. Well, I would call that a, a, an, unusual, an unusual fear for sure. Well, one of my favorite movies deals with fear. Uh, it's called Hoosiers, the, one of the great... Um, one of the great sports movies. And if you haven't seen, it's based on a true story. And it, it stars um, Gene Hackman, one of my favorite actors, is the star. Uh, and it's based on a true story that took place back in the 1950s. And basically, Gene Hackman, Hackman plays the part of his coach that moves into town from the outside. And he comes to this little place, this little town in, uh, in, in Indiana. And it's not even doesn't even show up on most state maps. And he shows up and he has a new way of coaching that they're not used to. And there's some drama that goes with that. And finally, you know, he jumps through all kinds of hoops and there's all kinds of controversy and stuff. But he finally coaches them and they realize that he actually knows what he's doing. And he coaches them to the point where they actually qualify for the state championship game that would be held in Indianapolis, Indiana. And, um, uh, you know, it's just something that is unheard of for a school that size. It's certainly unheard of in the little town of Hickory, Indiana, based on a true story. And so he takes them to the big game. And before the big game, he takes them into the auditorium. Now, the auditorium is new and different than what they're used to. And uh, certainly the size of the crowd that would be there is different. They're used to crowds of maybe a few hundred at best. Well, there would be thousands and thousands, possibly tens of thousands of people at this game. And needless to say that the city was bigger than they'd ever been to. Most of them had never been to the city, the great city of Indianapolis, Indiana. And so needless to say, they were a little fearful. They were a little fearful. And there's a scene where Gene Hackman, the coach, takes them into this this enormous auditorium and they're all looking around and, and you can tell they're just like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? You know, And he has them do something very unusual. He has them measure the distance from uh, the, the basket to the key, which is 15 feet. And he has them measure the distance from the floor to the rim, which is 10 feet. And they do this and they're not sure why they're even doing it. And then he makes this statement. He says, I think you'll find the same measurements as our gym back in Hickory. I love that scene. What, what is he doing? He's saying, you know what, he's giving them 
fam something familiar in the midst of a fearful time. And is reminding them that, hey, the circumstances have changed, but the game has not changed at all. You know, that's what God does with us. Whenever we face fearful circumstances in our lives, if we will listen, he will remind us of what is unchanging and what is still true. And for many people, this is a fearful time. I don't even need to hardly say that. However, even though the circumstances have changed from what they used to be, certainly in my lifetime, these are the most unusual circumstances I have ever faced, and I'm only in my mid-50s. In spite of all that, in spite of all the circumstances, I don't want to remind you just for a second that God remains the same. His promises are constant. His presence is still real. He's still faithful. He still reigns. He's still on the throne. He's still all-powerful. His kingdom has come. Access to his presence has not changed and has not been affected at all. Now let's read Isaiah chapter 8 that refers to fear. Chapter 8 verse 11. This is what the Lord says to me and to you with his strong hand upon me, warning... All right, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Now I'm going to pause for just a second right there. It reminds me of Romans chapter 12 that says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. It reminds me of the scripture that says, be in the world but not of the world. It reminds me of the scripture that says, come apart uh, from among them. All right, he says, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Let's read on verse 12. Do not call conspiracy. This is the reason. I read this a couple of years ago and that, that word kind of jumped off the page at me. I, I don't think I realized that word was even in the Bible. Well, there it is. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. Verse 14, he will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up this testimony of warning. There's that word again. Bind up this testimony of warning and seal up God's instruction among my disciples. That would be us. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. May God bless the reading of his word. Father, I pray that you would speak through your word, even through uh, this means, uh, through technology today. And I pray that our answer, Lord, would be yes, recognizing that you are utterly trustworthy, recognizing that you always, 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 want good for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's look at this. Number one point I want to make, do not fear. Verse 12. Some facts about fear. Fear not is the most repeated command in the Bible. In fact, there are 365 references to the words fear not, or at least that, that concept. 365 references for one for every day of the year now i don't believe that's a coincidence at all i think god wants us to not go a single day without hearing this word of comfort fear not now why would he make such a big deal of this he wants to you know us to have every one for every day of the year well first of all it's no fun to live in fear i don't think anybody any of you watching would say no i actually like i like fear i don't need to hear this message i like sleepless nights because i'm afraid i like walking around in paranoia afraid that somebody's going to attack me afraid that i won't have enough money afraid that i'll get a disease afraid that the world will come to an end you know i, I like this i don't think anybody likes fear well secondly Living in fear makes you vulnerable. I want to park on that thought for a minute. Living in fear makes you vulnerable. Fear can be paralyzing. I remember, I've probably told this story before, I was about 12, nah, 13 years old, and my parents did something that they almost never did. In fact, this might be the only memory I ever have as a kid of being left alone. I was about 13 years old, and it was unusual, and we lived in the country, and so it was quiet. You know, I'm talking in the country as in one car would pass, 
maybe once per every half hour you know and so it, it was a quiet night there was no stirring outside i didn't have the tv on my three brothers normally our household is a loud household it was quiet as a mouse and i was just sitting there i don't recall what i was doing or if i was doing anything and i was sitting in there in this unusually quiet house 13 years old my parents were only gone for like half an hour but it was really quiet it was getting dark outside all of a sudden i looked down and the controller on the floor that was about six feet from the, the wall, the controller for our TV antenna that went up a tower outside our house, right? It was connected through a cable that went through the wall. It was about six feet from the wall. That controller, little box, started to, on its own, move toward the wall. Somebody was outside pulling the cord. And I thought, oh my goodness somebody knows i'm alone and they're gonna rob me or they're gonna come in with an axe and you know or they're gonna kill me or something and i was paralyzed with fear i, I couldn't imagine what was going on and my parents finally came home and I, I gingerly went out to meet them and walked slowly you know and they they basically i remember they said what happened to you you're as white as a ghost well it turned out there wasn't a burglar there wasn't anybody outside you know who was outside it was our dog <laughs> the farm dog was outside pawing it never did this before or since that i know of, but some he was pawing at the cable and because he was pawing at the cable that that controller was being pulled toward the wall <laughs> and it freaked me out but it was paralyzing to me now let me just say a couple thoughts about that at best when you're paralyzed with fear uh it will slow us down at worst, it will paralyze you and stop you in your tracks. Now, by the way, when you're paralyzed with fear, you more easily give up your freedom. The enemy knows when to make power grabs in your life. He knows when he can take your will he knows when he can mess with your thinking and mess with your demeanor, mess with your outlook, mess with your emotions, mess with your life and your marriage and your home and your finances and your health. He knows, he knows that his opportunity is when you're paralyzed with fear. Let me just say that. You more easily give up your freedom. History throughout the ages has shown that when people are paralyzed with fear, they more easily give up their freedom. Listen Listen to what I'm saying today. Well, uh, a roaring lion literally paralyzes its prey before it completely devours it. First Peter chapter five, verse eight says, stay alert. Here's another warning, stay alert. Watch out uh, for your great enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And in other words, he is looking for someone that in, in one example is full of fear. He's looking so that he can take advantage of that. So he can steal from them. So he can devour from them. He's looking to steal your marriage, your home, your finances, your health, your your community, our country. He's looking to steal. He's looking to destroy. We don't need to be afraid of that, but we need to be aware of that. He is out there and he will paralyze us with fear if we can so that we won't, we won't fight back. We won't respond. We'll just be, okay, whatever you want, right? That's what happens when you're paralyzed with fear. A lion will paralyze its prey with its roar so he can destroy and devour. That's what Satan wants to do with us, his church, during this time. Elizabeth von, von Muggenthaler, a bioacoustician from Fauna Communications Research Institute in North Carolina, discovered that when a lion or tiger gives a deep, loud roar, its prey, its prey could actually experience paralysis on the spot. As powerful as a lion's roar sounds, it actually has no power at all. A roar cannot trap prey or kill it, unless you let it. A roar can only intimidate another animal into surrendering. In the same way, Satan will try to paralyze you with fear to intimidate you into surrendering, into giving up your freedom, into getting your worship. Uh, Isaiah 8 verse 12, back to our text, it says, do not con call conspiracy everything this people, all right, you could say everything this culture calls a conspiracy. Are there conspiracies out there? Sure. Are there conspiracy theories out there that aren't true? Sure. Are there conspiracies out there that are true? 
Absolutely. It's been more obvious to me today than ever that there are, yeah, there's a conspiracy out there. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Who do you think is behind all this stuff that's happening in our culture? Well, number two point, do not fear what other people fear. All right. In other words, be aware of what they fear, but don't get caught up in it. Be aware of what they fear. Be aware of what's going on, but don't get caught up in it. It makes me think of the 12 spies. Remember the story? A lot of you would know the story of the Israelites being uh, released from bondage from Egypt. And they, you know, went through all kinds of stuff, to make a long story short, crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. God miraculously moved so that they could be free, wandered in the desert for 40 years. Finally came to the border of the promised land. They sent 12 spies in to check out the land. Well, 10 of the spies, as most of you would know, returned with a negative report. Basically, they said there are giants in the land and we are like grasshoppers in our sight. We can never win this battle. But then it says two of them, Joshua and Caleb, gave a different Report. Basically, they were like, well, this is a done deal. This is set up by God for our victory. Now, hear me. The two, Joshua and, Caleb, Joshua and Caleb, the two came back with great courage, but the ten persuaded the crowd to move in fear. Now, nobody in the crowd that day said, I choose, I like being afraid. We talked about that a second ago. Nobody said, well, you know what? I'd, I'd prefer to be afraid than go with Joshua and Caleb. No, no, they said, let's choose wisdom because fear, they all said, let's choose wisdom because fear masquerades as wisdom. I'm drawing ideas from the pastor, Bill Johnson, for this point. Fear masquerades as wisdom. Does that sound familiar to you today? The 10 spies didn't lie. It's not like they came back and just filled everybody with lies. They told the truth. They just didn't tell the whole truth. They came back convincing people of something that was inferior to what God had said. And I want to just remind you this morning that what God says over your life, what God says over your life must be the thing that we feed our hearts on in these days, especially in these days. If we feed our hearts on only the facts, only news, the circumstances, the conspiracies around us, we will react in fear and never recognize it is fear. And we will consider ourselves to be people of great wisdom. Here's what Bill Heibel says about it. If you move in fear and live cautiously, all of your friends will call you wise. You just won't move many mountains. It takes courage to confront your fear. Someone once said courage, this isn't in my notes, but courage isn't the absence of fear. It's just facing your fear. It takes courage to confront and face what God has put in front of us, actually, that we may be afraid of. Listen to the dialogue of Joshua and Caleb. I love this. Uh, Numbers chapter 14, 7 to 9. The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land, that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against what against the Lord. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. There's that do not be afraid again. Well, they bring the Lord, the word of the Lord to a nation. This isn't just a conversation among two guys. This is the word of the Lord to a nation. Basically, they're saying do not rebel against the Lord by failing to enter a promise. Now, just let that run through your head for a minute. Do not rebel against the Lord by failing to enter a promise. They were on the border of the promised land. All the miracles that had preceded this moment in history were based on this promise, this promised land. Do not rebel against the Lord by failing to enter the promised land. That's basically what they were saying. In other words, your giant looks different when you believe a promise. 
All right, let's look at this. Matthew 6, 11, part of the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer, whichever you know it is by, whatever you know it is by, um, it says, give us today our daily bread. Right? Your giant looks different when you believe a promise. Right? Daily bread would be what I need for today. And tomorrow I'm going to pray that again because I know God will provide what I need for tomorrow. You're not convinced yet? Well, let's go on to, let's move to Psalm 23, the most famous, probably one of the most famous Psalms in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. All right. There are certain spiritual nutri nutrients, Bill, Bill Johnson says this, this is so good. There are certain spiritual nutrients you cannot get apart from defeating a giant, in this case, perhaps fear. The meal you are hungry for is in the triumph of the giant you are facing. It's in the, the triumph of the, the fear that you may be facing. God has given every one of us an appetite to be strong, to be overcomers, and we want to be winners. However, we want strength for the battle. And he is saying, my strength comes from the battle. The bat, you could say the battle is our bread. We're, uh, we're not, I'm not talking about a, a mental game where we imagine that there's no enemy. I'm not, not talking about being like a, an ostrich that just buries his head in the sand and, hey, let me know when everything is resolved and then I'll come out and I'll really have, you know, I'll really be a person of faith then and I'll really be courageous then. No, I'm not talking about that. Uh, I love the honesty of, of Joshua and Caleb where they talk openly about the news. Right, about these giants in the land. They talk openly about it. They're aware of the conspiracies, if you will, but they're just not impressed by them. Bill Johnson says, I have found that any time I am impressed with the size of my problem, it's because I lost sight of the size of my God. And I'm here today in part to remind you of the size of your God. God is bigger, listen, than COVID. God is bigger than what's happening in Afghanistan. God is bigger than what's happening on the southern border. God is bigger than what's happening, happening in politics. God is bigger than the prices of gas that seem to keep going up and up and up. God is bigger than the price of inflation that seems to keep going up and up and up and up. God is bigger. I'm here to remind you of that today. Well, there are some parts of our Christian lives God absolutely does for us. Isn't that true? He caused the victory to happen and I didn't do anything. All I did was just show up and he caused it to happen. He defended me or he promoted me. I understand that. There are those times. But there are parts of our Christian walk where the nutrients that we hunger for, the victory, if you will, that we hunger for, are actually found in the giants we are facing changing our perspective according to what God says. Well, what did God say? Joshua and Caleb picked something up from the Lord in this circumstance. The land of giants, that's our lunch. Don't you love that? The land of, that's, this is like, this is what we're going to feed on here, guys. And when we get through with lunch, we're going to have dinner. This is our food. Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of, in the presence of money. He didn't say, you prepare a table before me when the enemy is finally vanquished. No, he says, in the middle of the battle. In the middle of the circumstances, if you will. Let's mentally walk through this, this very strange setting. God has prepared a table uh, for, with the richest, most amazing food you'll ever eat in your life. And I suspect that God is a pretty good cook. And here's what's... Here, here is, is this table, and I, I picture the, remember the TV show, The Waltons? A lot of you would remember that. It seemed like uh, a lot of that show revolved around the, the supper table, the dinner table. And, and about anything could be going on. There could be any kind of circumstances. Maybe they couldn't pay the bill, or there was a, an animal that was sick, or there was a controversy, or there were marriage issues, or relational issues, or disease, or whatever. Whatever took place, it seemed to me, I mean reading it into a little bit, but it seemed to me everything was kind of worked out at the table. 
You know, that's where they talked it through and communicated and figured out the plan, you know, to go forward. Well, the table is the place of nourishment. It's a place of interaction. It's a place of fellowship. It's a place of connection, kind of like on the Waltons, right? And here you are on the other side of Jesus, whose eyes are burning with fire, but also with the most tenderness and compassion and love that you've ever seen in your life. And his words give you courage to face anything you could ever possibly face and your interaction with him at this table, so to speak, is something that defines our purpose, our reason for being, our destiny. It's life-giving. It's a life-giving encounter. And here it is in the presence of our enemies, in the midst of circumstances and world events in our country and in the world that are swirling around us in, in our state, in our families, in our community. And I, I share Bill Johnson's concern that many people sit at this table day after day after day and re, maybe rebuking and binding, you know, Satan and doing all these things because they're preoccupied with the enemy that's around the table and they never benefit from the nutrients of the moment. And they may come up victorious and say, well, we took care of that problem. And, and we have our, I've got my quiet time and I watch Joel Osteen every morning, you know, and I, I go to worship and I tune into Pastor Andy every Sunday. And, uh, you know, and, and yet we're lacking the nutrients and the very thing that would define our future because we're preoccupied with the devil. We're preoccupied with the stuff going on around us, with these conspiracies. Conspiracies. And do you ever find yourself, let me just time out here for a minute. Do you ever find yourself watching the news in order to relieve your fears? Now, even as I say that, it sounds like a silly thing to, to say, because if I was going to tell you, hey, uh, don't fear, which is one of my points today, the last thing I would prescribe if I was a doctor is to watch the news. <laughs> hey, hey, don't don't be afraid. And by the way, you should watch more news and that'll really help, right? I mean, that's ridiculous. But I find myself sometimes, if I'm not careful, I'm tempted to watch the news in hopes of relieving my fears. What do I mean by this? Uh, you know, before 2020, I confess that I, it's not like a, it's a sin, but I didn't really watch much news. I just wasn't that interested. I, I mean, I wanted to stay in touch with what's going on, but I watched maybe a couple times a week, and but I never watched like half an hour a day. You know, I'd maybe get little snippets of what's going on in social media and people would talk about stuff happening in the world and you can kind of keep up with what's going on, but I didn't watch it every day. Well, since 2020, you know what? I confess sometimes I'm watching every day for half an hour a day. I'm watching the snippets on social media, but, and I'm tempted sometimes, I'm tempted to watch the news in hopes that my fears will finally be relieved, right? Uh, the situation, in hopes that the situation at the southern border, the crises on the southern border, will finally be, be resolved and they'll, they'll, they'll uh, you know, change the policies or, or the COVID will finally go away and there won't be any controversy about children wearing masks or whether you should wear masks or whether you know the the vaccine is really a vaccine and does it really work and should we have to take it all these things oh i hope that it'll just go away and sometimes i watch the news hoping inflation will go down and gas prices will go down and the crisis in afghanistan will be resolved politicians will finally get along and do what's best for the country and corruption will finally be revealed and dealt with and justice will be served. And if I'm not careful, I easily begin to worship the news and the circumstances and the controversies and the conspiracies instead of the Lord. And it's great to watch the news with hope for change and keep in touch with what's going on. Don't put your head in the sand, but God has something greater for us. Look with me at verse 12. Isaiah 8, 12, it says, Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracies. Are they out there? Absolutely. Sure they are. It says, do not fear what they fear. It's like, be aware of it, but don't get caught up in it. Verse 13, the Lord Almighty is with, is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He is the one that should hold our attention if if we're going to live above fear so let me ask you what is holding your attention more the news or the lord jesus and his word 
Number three, replace fear with faith. I've shared before, I'm sure, that it was August 31st, 1992, my very first anniversary. This year, my Dorian and I will be have been will have been married 30 years. <laughs> Where has the time gone? I can't even believe it. Well, it was our first anniversary. We were living in the great Canadian city, Toronto, and we decided to go up, we decided to splurge and go up the CN Tower. There's a restaurant, a revolving restaurant at uh, top of the CN Tower. The CN Tower is 145 floors up. At one time, for several years, it was the highest freestanding structure in the world. And uh, mentally, I'll confess, I was, on the outside, I was trying to look relax but I was paralyzed almost as we went on that high-speed elevator and it wasn't a normal out of elevator what was unusual about the elevator it had a window <laughs> and I didn't exactly appreciate the window because the, the the beams would be flying by and it was this we were going fast and I was watching the ground disappear as we went up 147 floors now let me just just explain, I am not a, a stranger to danger, all right? Having grown up at a farm, uh, you face, it comes with the territory. You face things just about every day that could kill you. You're dealing with animals that weigh, in some cases, over a thousand pounds. I mean, they can do damage and will and, and do sometimes. And you're dealing with machinery that you could literally chew you up and spit you out. And, you know, and you're dealing with pulling wagon loads in the summertime of hay that weighs several tons. And we didn't have a big farm, but we had, you know, we were around stuff that was dangerous all the time. But the difference was, I was in control of that danger. My dad taught me how to operate the tractor so that the wagon load would not get away from me when I would go down a hill. He taught me how to gear down. He taught me how to stay away from the dangerous parts of the machines. He taught me how to handle the cows and the, uh, so that I wouldn't get injured. Well, in this case, I was not in control at all. I was paralyzed with fear. I was like, I don't know what's happening. I've never been this high. Of, you know, other than in a plane, I've never been this high up on a building in my life. And I was paralyzed with fear. And I, I got to the top and it, you should never do this probably, but it, do, do any of you ever look down the crack between the elevator and where the, the, the floor starts? I made the mistake of looking down the crack and you're looking down in this case, just into an abyss, 147 floors down. And I remember just walking up and my legs were actually, I it just, it's funny, I remember this. They were like tense and almost tired because I was so tense and walking slow, trying to look relaxed, but I was almost paralyzed with fear. Well, what did I do? I focused on what I knew to be true. You could say, I replaced my fear with faith. You may say, well, what are you talking about faith? Well, I chose to focus on what I knew to be true. The CN Tower was built in 1976 and had never fallen. That's a fact. <laughs> right? um, uh, no one had ever died in the restaurant that I know of, at least because of the height of the restaurant. Uh, the elevator had never fallen. Each year, 1.9 million people visit Canada's National Tower to take in the breathtaking views and enjoy all the CN Tower has to offer. The structure was more than enough to accommodate the people that it would hold. And guess what? The truth began to set me free. I began to relax and I began to realize I'm in a nice restaurant. I'm with the woman that I love, our first anniversary, and I sat down right next to the window looking down over the magnificent skyline of Toronto as that restaurant slowly revolved around and I was completely relaxed and we enjoyed a, a wonderful meal together and celebrated our anniversary. What happened? The truth set me free. The truth set me free. I play, replaced my fear with faith. That's what God wants to do in your life today. That's what God wants to do in your life today. He wants to replace your fear with faith. I know something about you. I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, what stage in life you're at. There's something that you fear. There's something that I could almost bet if I were a betting man that occasionally keeps you up at night, maybe more than occasionally. And I want to help you today. Uh, I believe God wants you, I don't just believe this, I know this, God wants you to be free of fear because that will paralyze you and the enemy will waltz right in and steal your freedom. And so here, and by the way, God never said fear not when there's finally nothing to fear. 
All right, it's like he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies, in the midst of what we're facing. We don't have to fear in the midst of what we're facing, not because there's nothing to fear, but because he's with us. He doesn't just say, fear not, and oh, you should feel better. Oh, now I know that I'm not supposed to fear not, I'll be okay. No, he gives us reason after reason after reason after reason why we don't need to fear. Let me give you just a few, just relax, you can close your eyes, you can keep your eyes open, just receive this today, these promises of not only fear not, but why we can fear not. Here's uh, just a few, Isaiah 43. Remember, there's 365 of these, Isaiah 43. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord. O Andy, O Joe, O Dora, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, O Dot Grand, whoever you are, listen to the one who created you. The one who formed you says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. 2 Timothy 1.7, I memorized this a long time ago. The Amplified Version says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline, abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not be, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them. Here's why. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. John 14, 27. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Psalm 27, one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? Let me just pause there and say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. It's not my money. It's not the circumstance. It's, it's not New York State. It's not the United States of America. It's not the Democratic Party. It's not the Republic the Republican Party. It's not how much money I have in the bank or what kind of home I live in or what kind of car I drive. No, the Lord is my light and my salvation. And because he's my light and my salvation, therefore I don't need to fear. The Lord is the fortress protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? Right, Hebrews chapter 13 says, I will never leave you. Never. I will never loosen my grip on your life. So we can say with great confidence, I know the Lord is for me and I will never be afraid of what people may do to me. 1 John 4, 18. Love never brings fear. For fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. In other words, if you're uh, living for Jesus and you've repented of your sins and you're following him and you press into that relationship, that will literally drive out fear if you're claiming the promises of God, if you're choosing to face your fear with the facts of who God is and you realize how big he is and how big he is compared to the little tiny fears that you have that you think are so big. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not re reached love's perfection. Just a couple more. I know I'm a little over time here, but I think you need to hear this. Psalm 23 verse 4 in the Passion Translation says, Even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me. You are already, you are, for you already have. Fear will never conquer me, for you already have. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely 
for you are near. And one more, Psalm 46, one to three, God, you're such a safe and powerful place to find refuge. The Passion Translation says, you're a proven help in times of trouble, more than enough and always available whenever I need you. So we will never fear even if every structure of support were to crumble away. We will not fear even when the earth quakes and shakes, moving mountains and casting them into the sea for the raging roar of stormy winds and crashing waves cannot erode our faith in you. Hey, I want to say, share a different benediction with you today. If you want to raise your hands and just receive this, this is from the Daily Decree by Brenda Kuhneman. Invading fear must go. Receive this today. Today we decree that any form of fear trying to invade your life is bound up in the name of Jesus. We come against all financial fear and say that every monetary need is met this year. We bind all fear regarding your family and loved ones. We say they are protected by God's angelic hosts. We decree that all fear of death and tragedy is bound and destroyed. We bind the fear of sickness and disease. We say that every fear of failure, rejection, oppression, and depression must leave you right now. We break off all fear of the future concerning the nations and the world events, and we declare these things shall have no ability to torment your mind. You are favored and blessed of God, and all shall be well concerning you. We agree on this together in faith in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said out loud in front of your screen. Now go and be the church.